Thank you, Dennis. Great singing tonight. Well, are you ready to receive what the Lord has for you through his word tonight? Yes. I hope you are. We're, uh, Pastor Jeremy scheduled for the first of the month, and last week was Easter, uh, so we moved him to this Sunday night. So we're looking forward to what God has laid upon his heart uh, to give us tonight. So, brother, would you come and give us what the Lord has given you? Thank you, Pastor. And so, uh, some of you may be aware that this uh, previous, or just yesterday, Saturday, we had a uh, teen activity, went to the roller rink, and so they had a lot of fun roller skating and rolling all over the place, and uh, although they had a lot of fun, I could tell, uh, roller skating themselves, I think it was more interesting for me and uh, Michelle to sit and watch them. Some of them, now, some of them are very graceful, I will give them that, but some of them are not. Where's Levi? And so, <laughs> so but we had a great time yesterday, and, uh, and so it really was a, a good time. And, uh, and so I am excited to be able to spend some time with these teens, and uh, I hope that they are excited and have a good time with us as well uh, as we try and minister to them. And so tonight we're going to be uh, looking back at a, uh, a portion of Scripture that we have been going over now for several months, actually. It's kind of funny looking at my calendar, seeing how far back uh, some of these go. And, uh, but, uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're continuing with the, the thought of the series called Stand. And so there's a primary thought that runs throughout this portion of the Scripture in Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18. And so and the thought is repeatedly reiterated, and whenever God wants us to get the point, or whenever God wants to get the point across, whenever God wants you to understand this is something that he values, so this is something that he puts a high priority on, he repeats himself over and over and over again throughout Scripture. And in this particular portion of Scripture, you see that a lot of times throughout the Bible, in other words, you usually have to go to a different section of the Bible to find a certain precept over and over again. But it's unique in this particular portion of Scripture that he states it multiple times, reiterates the thought of standing over and over. And so in one very succinct portion of Scripture. So in Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18, I hope you're there. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which, are the word of, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And so we see this, the command that's given here, and it's given here for us to stand. And it's interesting also to see who it is that we're commanded to stand against. And so, but we're going to focus tonight on the thought of standing and focusing on what is it that God equips us with in order for us to be able to stand. What is it that God equips us with that we can know, we can have confidence, that we have the protection of God on our lives and the protection in order to move forward with serving God in our lives and so we're going to look at that tonight where we're going to look at the helmet of salvation. And so before we go much further, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into the message. Dear God, I thank you again for this opportunity to be here tonight. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you also for the, your loving kindness in sending your son to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, thank you most of all that you are still working today. And so you still have a desire to work in our lives. You still have a desire to see people saved here in the United States. And I believe that you still have a great work to be done here in our country. And I hope that tonight we'll take it seriously, our responsibility to stand. I just pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. And so this portion of scripture reminds us that as believers, we are in a battle. Whether you want to accept it or not, whether you want to lay down, capitulate, retire, or surrender, you are in a battle. And so each and every one of us has a responsibility as a soldier for Christ. 
And so we have a responsibility to take the message forward. We have a responsibility to make or to progress forward for God in our society, in our families, in our workplaces, wherever we are at, we have a responsibility to make an impact for Christ wherever we are at. And so we are in a battle and we must take up arms. And so now before anybody take before someone on the internet takes that out of context, this is not promoting violence. And so but that is why it is imperative that everyone, every one of us must make a determination to stand. One of the things that, that keeps coming back to my, my mind and, and is a thought that, relative, or that I was reminded of that I've heard many times other people tell me is, that, is this. Fear is contagious, but so is courage. It's easy for when we see everybody else around us sitting down. And, okay, you're all sitting, so I'm not, no one's in trouble. All right. It's easier for us when we see people that are, are not willing to take that step forward or not willing to go forward and do those extra things that we know that God wants us to do in our Christian life. It's easier for us to say, well, since they're not doing it, I guess I don't want to, you know, I want to rock the boat, so I'm not going to do it either. But we are, we are commanded here to stand, have courage, go forward, stand up. Be that one that takes that first step forward in order to encourage others to follow behind. And so we must remember that we have a responsibility to take the, the gospel, but then also take the gospel uh, to the lost and dying world, but then also in our own life to live a life that is glorifying to God and that doesn't countermand the gospel message that we are sharing with those who are lost and dying. And so we see here that God gives us some, some pieces of equipment that will help us in, that, in this battle. And so previously we have spoken about our faith. And so we talked about the shield of faith and how that, that our faith protects us. And how it even talks about how it, it is the priority piece of equipment that God assigns to us. And so have faith in God. Have faith in his word. In our prayer, we need to be relying on the power of God to accomplish his will. If we try to do things in our own power, then surely it shall fail. But if we seek God's power and we seek God's direction, then there is, there is no greater power to rely on. We also need to be in truth. We need to rely on our in truth. And so we need to be girded with the belt of truth. In other words, it should be something that defines us and something that, that, is, uh, that people can look at us and understand that person is a Christian, but it is also something that is very useful to us. We need to be girded with truth. But then also we need to be in righteousness. And so wearing the breastplate of righteousness, we need to guard the vital areas of our spiritual life, which is our heart. And so because it says out of the heart are the issues of life. And so, and that is a paraphrase. But we need to have the breastplate of righteousness. What is it that guards your heart? A life that is focused on righteousness. It starts with salvation. That's the only true righteousness is being saved through Jesus Christ. But then as a Christian grows in their faith, that righteousness, the right living, is what helps protect your heart and guard you against sin, or sin or creeping into your life and ruining your life and ruining your testimony. But then also, we need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And so that was our last message uh, just a month ago now. And so we see that we need to have the shoes on our feet. That's what we're talking about being, have, being shod, putting shoes on for the preparation of the gospel. And that preparation talking about having a prepared foundation, or having an essential starting point. The gospel is where it all starts. You can, try and make, you can try and bring someone in and say, well, you must be perfect little people. You must sit down. You must never do anything wrong. If you make any noise during the service, you're out. But that's not where we start. We start at the gospel. We start with, hey, you need to make sure that you know you're saved. And then we let the Holy Spirit start doing their work. The preparation of the gospel is that foundation bedrock. But then also, we need to be found in the gospel, but then also, we not only are we found in the gospel, but as we grow in Christ, where does our foundation come from? Does it come from our ideas, our own philosophies and precepts? No. It comes grounded in God's word, grounded in the teachings of Christ. And so we looked at that, that last, last month now. And so we see that we must be founded on the teachings of Christ. 
And so in Ephesians 6, verse 17 now, we come to the next piece of equipment that God prioritizes in our life and says, hey, these are things that you need to have in your Christian life if you really want to be effective in serving God, if you really want to be effective in a, a effective soldier in the battle that wants to continue the cause of Christ forward, then the next thing we need to have is we need to have the helmet of salvation. Now, a helmet, if for some of you that may not be aware, most people here, I think if you've worked in any kind of construction or if you've worked in any kind of uh, uh, skilled trades or something like that, most all skilled trades require you to wear a helmet. And so a helmet itself is very simply a piece. Now, I'm going to call it armor because we're dealing with, with uh, the armor of God and the, the armor of the Christian soldier. But the helmet is a protective piece of armor that is worn on and protects the head and is still used, and it's even still used today in modern times in modern militaries. And so even you'll see soldiers today, you'll see Marines today that still wear helmets to protect their head. And so uh, even I, when I had the opportunity to serve our country in the United States Marine Corps, I had to wear a helmet. And so, and one of the things that you find out very quickly when you start wearing a helmet, and so it's even more so if you wear a, I had to wear a construction hat uh, for a while in a different job at one point. And so I'll tell you this, the two helmets are not the same. <laughs> and so I would prefer to wear a construction hat, a hard hat, compared to a military, military uh, uh, Kevlar helmet any day. So, but for looking at, for the soldier standpoint, and even at the time that this was written, so the Apostle Paul is, the Holy Spirit is using the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is very intimate and very familiar with the armor of Roman soldiers. And so because he's been a prisoner now from time to time in, with, uh, for, you know, of Rome, and so he knows, he's familiar with the equipment of a Roman soldier. And so, and even at the time, even during the times of Rome, the helmets that were worn by the Roman soldiers weren't exactly comfortable, and they weren't light. And so, and the same thing is true today for anybody that served in, in, in our military and had to wear a helmet, you know that they're very, they're very heavy. Then on top of that, they're very hot. And so, and then in general, they put little pads in it now, and I'm sure they probably put more pads in it than when I was in even but they, they put all sorts of pads in it, but it's still uncomfortable. It doesn't really, it, it's not really made to be worn on the head, I don't think, but uh, it's made to protect your head. And, uh, and so it's extremely uncomfortable. Even though it is uncomfortable and even though it's, it's somewhat undesirable to wear at times, we see that the piece of equipment is very useful and it must be trusted by those who are wearing it. And so one of the things that we used to get yelled at for all the time, and it was because the thing was hot, the thing was heavy, the thing was uncomfortable. They were always having, our sergeants were always having to yell at us, put your helmet on. And so, and the reason being is that the discomfort of it all made us not want to rely on it. We wanted to, to have our hats on, which were much, or our covers, which were much more comfortable. But... I will, there's one thing that I remember most about my helmet that I had when I was serving in the, in the Marine Corps. And that was when I was in, when I just got in, I was doing my infantry training. So I was learning how to be a, a, a fighter, or f learning how to fight for our country. And um, one of the things that they had told us, and I don't remember why, I don't know why I remember this one little, little piece of information from, from training, but they did tell us this. They said, if you're ever in a situation where you know you're in a blast radius. In other words, you know there's a bomb that's going to go off, and you cannot get away from it. In other words, you know that you can't run from it. You have to stop, and you're going to have to just deal with it. They said, lay down on the ground, because the blast always goes up in kind of a, a cone shape. They said, put your hands inside your helmet, cover your ears to keep your eardrums from blowing out, and open your mouth so that you can equalize the pressure in your lungs when the explosion goes off. Why do I remember that? I have no idea. I still remember that today. During one of our exercises, we were uh, simulating. Now, I've never been in combat. And for those that have, I thank you so much for your service. And so, but I did train for combat. And in one of those training scenarios, we were assaulting a small village. We had overtaken the village. And so, and then we were holding it now and waiting for reinforcements and waiting for an, an oncoming attack. And so that attack did eventually come. And so, and when it came, my fire, I was a fire team leader, and so I, my squad had been set 
And so you have little units called fire teams. You have a slightly bigger unit called a, uh, a squad. My squad had been put on the northwest side of the town in order to guard that, that exposed flank. And so, and I was on the far, far outside edge of that with my fire team. And so, and I had, so as, when the enemy did finally attack, or our simulated enemy did finally attack, they came in, and so, and as they were coming in, I was the, since I was the fire team leader, my job was to make sure everybody had everything they needed, and then also to relay any information back to our squad leader. I had to relay some information about the fact that we were under attack, but then also, we had a, what was called a, an automatic weapon. It was a belt-fed weapon that, was, that burns through ammunition extremely fast. And in the middle of an attack, you go through it even faster. And so we were attacking. We were running out of ammunition. I had to go relay that information. That, hey, we're running out of, or we are heavily under heavy attack, and we're running out of ammunition. So I'd go running off to relay that information to my squad leader. And while I was doing that, the, one of the things that we would do during our simulated attacks is we did have a radio, and we also had what were called observers. Now, pretty much the job, I'd love to be an observer, by the way, because one of the, pretty much the main job of the observer when we were doing this was pretty much he would, he would walk around with the GPS, and as we would radio in artillery strikes or air, air strikes, he'd walk with the GPS, he'd walk over to wherever we said to, to drop something, and he'd take a quarter stick of dynamite, with what, what they're called artillery simulators. So pretty much it's a quarter stick of dynamite with uh, a, uh, a bottle rocket strapped to it. Bottle rocket whistles like you hear like incoming rounds and then the, the quarter stick of dynamite goes off and makes a big boom. And so these things make such a big boom that even though my, my fire team was in a building, they were not allowed to throw those quarter sticks of diamonds inside the building because if they did that, they could literally blow out the walls of the building. And so they were, only, they were throwing it all around our building when I started to leave. And so as I'm leaving, with, because of the artillery strike, there was a general withdrawal that was called. And so in other words, they said we, couldn't, we could not hold that position without artillery, counter artillery support, so we had to leave. And as I was running, running back to tell my fire team, we got to get out of here, grab your stuff, let's go. All of a sudden, one of those, those observers pulled the, the pin on one of those artillery simulators and threw it. And I don't think he was watching where I was running because he threw it right in front of me. And I could see the look in his eye like, oh, no, I just killed a 19-year-old kid with a quarter stick of dynamite. Because he just had this look, and I, I saw him start to mouth like, run! <laughs> and so and I'm, as, as soon as I saw that course of dynamite, the first thing that came to my mind was, i got to get out of here. But all of a sudden, my feet were glued to the ground. I don't know why. I could not move. And all I could think about was that little, that little instruction that we received, if you're ever going to get blown up, make sure you put your hands inside your helmet. <laughs> and so... So I did exactly what I was told. I dropped to the ground immediately. The, the guy that had thrown the stick of dynamite was yelling things at me. I'm sure they're probably not appropriate to repeat here in church. And I dropped to the ground. I put my hands in my helmet. I opened my mouth, and I covered my ears. And so when that quarter stick of dynamite went off, it lifted me inches off the ground. I remember feeling the concussion. I could feel the way I felt it suck the air out of my, my lungs for a little bit. Or at least that's what it felt like. I could feel that wave, that blast wave hit me. And I could, I, it literally shook the ground and threw me up and brought me back down. But my helmet had absorbed all of the concussion for, concussive force. And so now it may have been because that really wasn't a core stick of dynamite in the grand scheme of, of uh, demolition artillery and different things like that really isn't all that much. You know, it gets a lot bigger. Booms get a lot bigger. But... I trusted my equipment, and because of that, my equipment protected me. And uh, so when it comes to the battle that we are faced with, we need to remember to keep our helmet on. In warfare, one of the objectives of an attacking or defending army is to demoralize its enemy. The desire is to remove, or you are trying to remove their desire to fight or resist. You are trying to cause them to disobey their orders and to become ineffective as a fighting force. You say, okay, well, how is it that we do that then? 
The way that you do that is by denying them access to information about the opposing force's location, strength, and intentions. And additionally, the opposing force tries to make their enemy believe they are outnumbered and cut off with no hope of assistance. If you can do that, that is the ultimate desire. And so over now millennia, thousands and thousands of years of warfare, that doctrine has never changed. That is a, a doctrine that the, war, the Romans followed. That was a doctrine that the Mongols followed. That was a doctrine that any really truly successful army in history has followed. And when they, were, when they accomplished it, they were almost unstoppable. So one of the things that, that mankind developed in response to that was the helmet. You say, what? They developed the helmet? They put a tin can on their head? Why? Because the helmet allows, it protects the head, and it allows the observer, or allows the wearer to observe the enemy without fear of injury. What is it you want them to do? You want them to keep their head down. And that's even true today. You don't want, you do not want your opposing, your enemy to stick their head up above whatever they're hiding behind. You want them to keep their head down so that you can move around them. And the same thing is true with us. As a matter of fact, the Bible even tells us that there is an enemy out there that is moving around us looking for that weakness. In 1 Peter 5.8 it says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says literally that you have an enemy. Every one of us has an enemy. And he wants you to keep your head down. He doesn't want you to trust your equipment. He doesn't want you to rely on the helmet of salvation. He wants you to believe that he has you outnumbered and that it is hopeless, that this country is gone and there's nothing that we can do about it. He's walking around. He's trying to hit your flank. That's always the objective in, in, in modern military doctrine. You are always trying to pin down and outflank your enemy. And that's what Satan is trying to do to every one of us. Much the same way a lion walks around a herd of gazelle trying to move them and keep them unstable. He wants you to keep your head down. He doesn't want you sticking your head up with that helmet of salvation on, looking at where he's at and trying to, trying to address his attacks. The Bible tells us that salvation guards the head and protects the mind from Satan's attacks. Satan is looking for the areas that you are weak in and unprepared and unprotected. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. So how is it then that we are to guard against this? What areas, what is it, what protection does the helmet of salvation pr provide us? What abilities does it give us? We see first off, that it gives us assurance of salvation. There's another portion of Scripture that, that correlates with this portion of Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, it says this, But let us, that's talking about Christians, those who accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And so the Bible tells us that we need to, as a, for a helmet, we need to put on the hope of salvation. And it correlates directly with this portion of scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 where it says, take the helmet of salvation. And what it is telling us here is it says that salvation provides us hope. You say, now, so what is hope? Does that mean that, you know, I cross my fingers and I, I go, oh, please let this work, please let this work, please let this work? No. That hope is talking about a, about a happy expectation or a confidence of our faith. It's talking about relying and trusting in salvation. Understanding that there is no losing your salvation. There is nothing more that you have to add to your salvation to know that your salvation or that you, your ability to go to heaven is complete. You say, well, then how do I know that? Well, first thing it tells us is this. We must accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. In John 14, 6, it says, Christ speaking to us says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It starts with Jesus Christ. Much like we had talked about before, how Christ was that foundation. He's that cornerstone that we must have. 
You, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you don't even have the helmet. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But then not only that, when it talks about Christ, it even spells it out here in John 14, 6. He says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Many times we like to add things to the gospel. We like to add things to what is it that gets us to heaven. Oh, well, yes, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, but if you're not baptized, you're not going to go to heaven. That's a lie. The only thing that gets you to heaven is, a salv- is putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's why it says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is no good deed that you can do in and of yourself to get yourself to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says there is no way. The only way to get there is by faith, accepting the grace or the gift that God has given us. And that was Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for your sins when you did nothing to earn it. And I did nothing to earn it. But I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The only thing that gets us to heaven is our faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And that's why it says this you say, well, I know i got to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. i got to pray. i got to accept him. And we're even dealing with that now with some of our teens is that, well, I know I have accepted Christ, but I made a mistake. And so now what do I do? Have I lost my salvation? The Bible tells us this in John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then he finishes in verse 30. I and my Father are one. In John chapter 10, God gives a very clear example of how is it that we are saved and how is it that we know that we can never lose our salvation. The Bible tells us that when we get saved, we are very clearly in the hand of God. And he says, no one is able to pluck me out of God's hand. You say, well, what does pluck mean? Pluck means to forcibly remove. It has the idea of ripping or tearing something free of, of some, someone's grip or tearing it free of some sort of fastening. And so what it's telling us here is there is no one that can ever forcibly rip you out of God's hand. No matter how bad you sin, you can't remove yourself out of God's hand. You cannot force yourself out of God's hand when you two get saved. Now, we'll look at here that later, but it can, wreck, it can mess your life up pretty good choosing to disobey God. But nothing changes your salvation. Once you are saved, you are always saved. And there are people that say, well, if you sin bad enough. You know, if you're, a, if you're the kind of person that you murder somebody or if you do something, real, something really heinous or abominable, well, then you can just walk right out of God's hand. But what that is telling, that's what that person is telling you and what you're, if you believe that what you are actually in all honesty saying is that your sin makes you strong enough that now you can rip yourself out of God's hand. You just became stronger than God because you're a sinful person. Does that make sense to anybody else? It shouldn't because God says that's a lie. And so there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is nothing that can remove you out of his hand. But what is it that Satan wants you to do? He wants you to doubt your salvation. He wants you to believe that, well, you know what? You're not a good enough person. You can never serve God. God will never want to use you because of whatever you've done. But the simple truth of it is this. God does love you. If you accepted him as your personal savior, you are saved and you can never lose that. And God does want to use you. And so it's just your willingness to whether or not you are going to be used or not. And so Satan is looking for that area of weakness in your life where he wants to try and take it and he wants to twist it and make you think that you are unusable and unlovable and undesirable to God. But the truth of the matter is, is God loves you so much that he is willing to give his son to pay for every wrong thing that you have done. And he does care about you. And if you've accepted him as your savior, there is nothing that can change you positionally in that relationship. You will always, forever, be saved. And so our hope, our happy expectation, our confidence, our, our faith 
is that if we put our trust in Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross, in other words, that he paid for all the wrong things I've done, nothing can ever change the fact that I'm saved. And nothing can ever change the fact that you're saved either. The helmet of salvation guards our head. And don't let anybody ever try and convince you otherwise. And if you ever have questions, go to the, God's word because it is rife with scripture that tells you that you will, you will never lose your salvation. If you want to hear more, I have more. But then not only that, we see that God, yes, he, our helmet of salvation protects us and lets us know for certain that we are going to go to heaven and that there is nothing that we have to fear. But then also we see this, our helmet of salvation also drives us towards sanctification. You say, what does sanctification mean? Sanctification means being set apart and dedicated to service of for God. And so when the Israelites sanctified the, uh, the tabernacle when they were in the wilderness, they were setting it apart for service to God. That was all that it was to ever be used for. It was not to be used for the materials that were in the, the tabernacle were only and forever to only be used for service to God. And so in us as Christians, we are sanctified, and that is our focus. Our focus is only and forever to only be used by God. You say, but i got to work. The Bible says that a man who doesn't work doesn't deserve to eat, so I think God wants you to work. Well, what about, you know, i got to take care of my family. The Bible says that a man who doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. I think God wants you to take care of your family. You say, well, but what if i got to... But, I, my parents, they tell me what I do. You know what? God says, honor thy father and mother. He says, children, obey your parents. I think God wants you to obey your parents and honor your parents properly. So you can try and make up whatever excuse it is that you have for not wanting to serve God or not serving God. But the very simple fact of the matter is, is that God, every situation in your life, God already has an answer for it. And there's a way that you can and you should be serving God in your life as, a, as an employee, as a husband or as a wife, as a, a child. Whatever the situation is, whatever, the, whatever situation you want to bring up, God already has an answer for it. And as Christians... Every aspect of our life should be focused on pleasing God. You know, one of the things, and at first, when I first got married, I think my wife got a little offended. If I remember the situation properly, she'll probably correct you. So ladies, go talk to her later on. You can hear the real story. But when we first got married, you know, of course, you know, you're, you're whispering sweet nothings into your, each other's ears and all, these other, all this other nonsense that goes away after about seven years. Um, <laughs> I can't even keep a straight face saying that. But, but one of the things that I did tell her was that my focus was not in our marriage was not to make her happy. And of course, I can you imagine a young wife not appreciating that statement. And but my focus was on serving God and keeping making God pleased with the way I conducted myself in our marriage. And, um, and so, now, regretfully, I don't always do that. But that was one of the things. And, of course, she took, was a little taken aback from it. But in all honesty, when, if I was doing everything I'm supposed to for God in my marriage, my wife will never have a complaint. And so, in husbands, if you keep your focus on serving God and not just keeping your wife happy you'll find that your wife will be far happier than if you focus on, on fulfilling her every whim. And trust me, my wife has a lot of whims. <laughs> See, I had to dig the hole. I, I dug myself out and I dug deeper. There we go. And so, <laughs> I love my wife very much. If you haven't... And if you haven't figured that out, I love my wife very much. And the fact that she puts up with me and puts up with all this, you know she has to love me. But in every area of our life, our focus should be on pleasing God. The problem comes, much like with, the, with people in the situation that we're describing here of having a, a military-style helmet on, is when people don't trust their equipment. When we stop trusting God and believing that he knows what's best for us in every situation, that he's already got it covered. Yes, the precepts he gives us sometimes may seem a little simplistic, like, wow, that doesn't, really, that doesn't really specifically address my exact situation. You're right. 
But in general, it addresses every situation in your life. And it gives you a guideline for how you are to conduct yourself in every situation of your life. But you have to trust it. The same way that you trusted the scriptures, the, uh, the Bible, the word of God, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your, as your savior, and I'm sorry, if you're listening to what someone else told you, what a pastor told you, a pastor told you, our pastor you can believe. This one, you got to question all the time. Whatever a pastor told you, whatever a, a relative told you, whatever somebody else told you, oh, you're saved. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't even matter what I say. What matters is what God's word says. And your trust should not be in what I tell you, should not be in what a family member tells you. It should not be in what anyone else tells you about your salvation. Your faith should be in God's word. And that's salvation. But then now we take it over here to sanctification and we say this. Once we get saved, God doesn't just save us from, uh, being, from perishing in a lake of fire. He saves us to serve him. And so he sanctifies us now, he dedicates us, he focuses us for the service of serving him now. And so and if we are going to do that, then the Bible tells us that then we must, we must trust his word the same way we had to with salvation. And so otherwise, you might as well take the helmet off and throw it on the ground. And then go jump on the bomb. Because without it, you are going to be exposed Romans 8, verse 32 says this, 31, 32 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, delivered him, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you're saved, if, you have, if you've received the salvation that God offers you, and that you know your sins are paid for, then why can't you trust him with the rest of your life? He was willing to send his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. And not because we asked him to. Not because we even knew. We didn't even know that we needed him to do it. He did it because he knew and because he loved us so much. And because he didn't want us to spend an eternity in the lake of fire. So what did he do? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. And so we'll trust him for salvation. But then we won't, go, we won't let him go any farther. Hey, I'll accept you as my personal savior, Lord, but you know what? You don't get my kids. I do whatever I want with them. They're mine to raise, mine to take care of. No, they're not. You belong to God. You're sanctified. Everything that belongs to you now belongs to God. I love you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. But when it comes to my love life, I'm going to do what I want to do. No, you don't. You don't, belong to, you don't belong to yourself. You don't get to set your own rules. He does. He bought you for a price. The greatest price that anybody can ever give. You belong to God. And so as a Christian, we need to remember that, that not only does Satan want to get us off, he wants to keep our heads down. He wants to keep us from focusing, one, on salvation, or he wants us to believe that we don't really truly keep our salvation. But then also we need to remember that he wants to make us ineffective. The same way the ultimate desire of one opposing force towards another is to make the other army ineffective. Get them to disobey orders. Satan wants you to do the same thing. And how? He wants to keep your head down. He doesn't want you trusting in the helmet of salvation. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, as the instruments get ready to come. We need to remember, we are in the midst of a battle. We're in a battle for the souls of mankind, and our adversary is walking about seeking areas of weakness to exploit. There's nothing Satan would love to do more than to tear this church apart. There's nothing more that he would want to do than to make us ineffective as soldiers for Christ. But God has given us a helmet. He's given us other pieces of equipment. But tonight, he's given us a helmet. Question is, is your helmet on? Are you saved? Are you trusting in yourself to get to heaven? Or are you trusting in the one that paid it all? The only one that can pay it all. 
the only one that can actually get you to heaven, Jesus Christ. Where is your hope placed? Are you trusting in Christ's payment for your sins? Are you trusting that that was enough to pay for everything, every sin you've committed? Or do you believe that you have to somehow maintain your salvation? There's nothing that can pluck you from the hand of God. Maybe you sit here tonight, you say you are a Christian, or you are a Christian. You have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your salvation is based squarely upon the Word of God. In your personal life, though, are you trusting God with your day to day decisions? Maybe even not just your day to day decisions, maybe about your life goals, your focus. Is your focus on God? Is your focus on serving God and doing it what it is that He commands you to do? Or are you going to follow the philosophies and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ, as the Bible tells us in Colossians? The decision tonight is yours. As the instrument gets ready to come and as the pastor gets ready to close the invitation, if there's a decision you need to make tonight, I pray that you'll make the decision to put your helmet on. Thank you. Pastor. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around for a moment. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart. As the piano begins to play tonight, folks, we've seen over the last several weeks the need to stand as we've seen this series from Pastor Dahlquist. We see tonight the need to have this helmet of salvation. And firstly tonight, you need to be saved. And I believe we're in a room of believers here this evening. But maybe you're online listening as well. Maybe you're here tonight. You've never received Christ. Settle that today. Know him today. And then for us that are believers, for us that know we're a child of God, let us go out and give this gospel to a lost and dying world. Let us go out with the urgency to want to see others have the same helmet. Let us go out and also want to serve the Lord, to be obedient to Him. As not only does He save us, but then that work of sanctification is done throughout our lives, where we are set apart to serve Him. But we ought to be willing to do that very thing. Maybe the Lord spoke in your heart tonight just in that matter, just as tonight you would commit to the Lord to serve him more today than you did yesterday. Maybe the Lord speaking to your heart tonight and through the Spirit to say, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. I want to commit my service to you, no matter what those around me say. But Lord, as you set me apart to serve you, help me to do that very thing. Help me to serve with all of I have, with all that I can, wanting to be a blessing in return. Folks, as Dennis comes and leads us in this verse invitation, if God has spoken to your heart, do business with him right there where you sit. Spend some time in prayer. Spend some time committing to the Lord what the Spirit has spoken to your heart about. And I assure you we can then go out and serve the Lord together. Brother Dennis.